paraphernalia before we get started. Is that it? Am I on, Peter? Yeah, great. Well, good morning. Those, that last uh, verse we sang, I can't remember the exact words there, but Lord, have your way in me. Is that not what we should all be saying throughout our day? You know, um, times are difficult, and uh, Lord, we need to allow God to reign in our uh, hearts 24-7. This is not a Sunday morning thing. This is about a lifestyle. It's about a way that we uh, live our lives for, for Jesus and uh, and focus on all that he has for us. So how many people have been uh, reading our nativity book? A few hands going up. Are we enjoying it? Oh, a few more hands. That's bad. That was a bit more encouraging. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's great. It really um, traces... It's called The Incredible Journey for those that are not reading it. Um, it's called The Incredible Journey for those that are reading it, actually. But um, it, um, it traces from the dawn of time in creation through to when... Jesus came into the world. Um, and on day two of the book, uh, I was really reminded of uh, when God first showed me the enormity of creation. That's mentioned in here, and I'm going to read a bit from that in a second. Uh, but uh, a number of years ago, um, I think it was probably over 20 years ago now, Ruth, I think, that we were, um, we were in Cambodia. Now, uh, Ruth used to work in Thailand for a couple of years, so she had... Um, and she'd got some friends um, uh, that she'd uh, got to know there. One of them had married a Cambodian man, and she lived and ministered in Cambodia. So we went to stay with her for a couple of days um, back at the beginning of the millennium. And uh, I was outside on her balcony. It was a wonderful place. It was an all-wooden structure on stilts, so that when the rainy season sort of raised up, if you were out of the dry, uh, you're, you're in the dry. And... There was, um, it was a really cloudless night one evening and I was stood out on the balcony and you know the concept, I'm sure most of you at least, uh, of light pollution and how in this country, the light, or in the West in general, the light that we have from um, unnatural sources like street lights and, and so forth uh, really impinge uh, on our view of the stars and I was looking out in this um, in Cambodia and the sky was inky black and there was I'd never ever seen stars like it it was like tiny 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 diamonds crystal clear all over the sky I've never experienced anything like it before or since and I, I was reminded of that when um, we came to the day two of our nativity book and I'm going to read a bit for you here because the numbers are mind-boggling. From time immemorial, the stars have fascinated people. Many did and still do believe that they directly affect human beings' activities and destinies. Astrology is the name for it. In stark contrast, the Bible can call on the sun, moon and stars to praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. So this opening chapter of Genesis may be viewed as a powerful polemic against any notion that God needed their help, our help. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night, not even giving the sun or moon the courtesy of a name. Then almost as an afterthought we read, he also made the stars. Now it's only in recent times, with the advantage of the Hubble Space Telescope and the like, that we've begun to appreciate more fully the astonishing claims wrapped up in that statement. Our galaxy, the Milky Way, is composed of 100 billion stars. That's one with about 12 noughts, I think, on the end of it. Some astronomers think there are twice that number. Our nearest star neighbour is Proxima Centauri. This is the nearest one, 4.3 light years away, a mere thousand billion miles. And how many galaxies are there? At least another 100 billion. So how many stars in the universe? Well, that's quite a lot. <laughs> 10 billion trillion, approximately, of which our star is one. Astronomy is the name for that. Now, 
that it's just mind-boggling, isn't it? It goes on to say something like uh, that for every person on earth, bear in mind that there's about how many of us on the earth? About 70 plus million, something like that. That there are tens of millions of stars per person. So you can lay claim to those one or two of those this morning for yourself. There you go. Um, but last week, um, yeah, that actually that, that brings to mind also uh, a, 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 a carol that we sing, a modern day carol, a relatively modern day, by Graham Kendrick, uh, where he, s- he sings, Hands that flung stars into space to cruel nails surrendered. And we're going to um, look at the opening verses of Genesis again, as Roy Sell did last week, but we're going to look at them from a slightly different perspective as we look at the elements of the second section of our book. So Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters and God said, let there be light and there was light. So at the beginning of time, before God created Adam, before he said, let there be and the land animals came into being, before God said, let there be, and I'm repeating these words deliberately, you'll understand why in a minute. Before God said, let there be, and the birds of the air and the fish of the sea were created, before he said, let there be, and the trees and other vegetation appeared, before even the sun and the moon and the stars were flung into space, before all of that, when the earth was formless and void, it was the light of God that shone on the earth, shone on the earth and gave light to all mankind. And at the beginning of time, before the sun, moons and stars were created, God said, let there be light. And there was light. And that light of God is eternal. By comparison, look at what Isaiah the prophet and the apostle John said about the temporary nature of the cosmos and all that he created. What did Isaiah say about when God will draw this world, this universe, to a conclusion. Isaiah 34, verse 4 says, All the stars in the sky will be dissolved and the heavens rolled up like a scroll. All the starry host will fall like withered leaves from the vine, like shriveled figs from the fig tree. And the Apostle John, um, in, uh, in the revelation that God showed him in visions that would happen at the end of time, said this, The heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up and every mountain and island was removed from its place. This world, the cosmos even, as it stands right now, is temporary. And when Jesus returns, he will make all things new, a new heaven and a new earth. But unlike all of creation, including the sun, moon, stars, all of which will eventually wear out, God's light is eternal. And it's that light that is in each one of us that's put our faith and trust in Jesus. The book of Revelation uh, refers to how at the end of time there will be no sun or moon because God will be our light. So God was the light before creation and he will be our light at the end. Let's come back to the, uh, the dawn of time once again. Even before time began, what does God say? And this is really where I'm coming to the nub uh, of, the, of the issue here. Colossians 15, verse 17, Paul writes, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all of creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And Peter, in writing to the early churches, said something similar about Jesus' origins. 
For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. So together with God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, Jesus... God the Son was there before the creation of the world, before the beginning of time. All things were created through and for Jesus. But even before time began, uh, before the creation of the universe, before time began, it was foreplanned, foreordained, if you like, that Jesus would be our salvation. That was the plan, even before this was all created. He would be a sacrificial lamb that once and for all would be the sacrifice that brings redemption for sin, salvation for all that would put their faith and trust in him. So the Old Testament starts in creation with God shining his light on the earth. But look at the New Testament and how the Apostle John starts his gospel. And notice again the reference to light. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Just like uh, Paul says here, in, uh, sorry, as Peter said. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So have you ever wondered about those words? We look at them fairly frequently at Christmas time. Have you ever wondered about that? In the beginning was the word. Have you ever wondered quite what that means? I've pondered about that quite a bit over the years. Why is Jesus referred to as the word? It's logos in the Greek. In the beginning, creation came about, as we've read at the beginning of Genesis, because God spoke. He said, let there be. And we all know, of course, that with speech, words are spoken. But the Apostle John wrote, in the beginning was the word And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Somehow, and if you can get your head around this any better than me, please see me after. Uh, but, But let that sink in a bit, you know, because in the beginning was the Word. What does that exactly mean? Somehow, Jesus was the Word that God spoke. And through that Word, all things were created. Does that make sense to people I've st- I, that's the best I can explain it that Jesus was the word that was spoken by the Trinity if you like by God the Father may be that Jesus was the word that was spoken and through him all things were created as we've read already let's switch back to the concept of, of light in uh, Matthew 4 um, we, we read uh, the people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of, of death, a light has dawned. And from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Matthew relates about how after Jesus' baptism, after his temptations in the wilderness, how Jesus began Um, his ministry in fulfilment of that passage from Isaiah now uh, or or of a passage from Isaiah Matthew was quoting Isaiah 9 verse 2 part of a really well known passage but before we just look at that um, I think it's important to realise that the word that God speaks through prophets can very often be And I remember back in the day, for those that have been around here as long as I or longer, um, back in the days of Phil Webb having this conversation with Phil, and he he made the point, and I've latched onto this 
and, and I think he's absolutely right, that with the prophets, that, uh, you know, a, a, a prophet uh, that gives words from the Lord, you know, whether that's Isaiah, Jeremiah, or Ezekiel, or any of the others in the Old Testament, that the prophet come, uh, gives, is given a word from God, and it might be about an event that's soon to take place, it might be about an event that's further into the distance, and it might be even further than that to the end of time. Let's have a look at what I mean by that. So Isaiah 9 verse 2, and this is a passage uh, from through 2 through to verse 7 that we use a lot at Christmas. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. But let's skip a few verses down to verse 9. Uh, because it's here that Isaiah zooms forward in time. He's talking about, uh, in that first verse, about the coming of Jesus. Now, bear in mind that Isaiah wrote his book somewhere around about 650 years before Jesus was born. So, he's in, the, in verse 2, he's talking about the coming of Jesus. But then, in verse 5, he zooms forward to the end of time. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. So though Isaiah shows how ultimately there will be an end to war and suffering and discord and Richard very helpfully in his time leading us in prayer earlier on pointed at the way that the, that the, the world is just so full of war, is it not? You know, uh, not, not, it's been for over a century now that we just had numerous conflicts. And it seems to be intensifying. It's all over the world now. I take a, a magazine called The Week, um, and there's a roundup of uh, you know, good quality news for the whole week. And every, every time, there's loads of stuff going on that we don't hear of on the news channels. Loads of wars everywhere. But Jesus says that every, uh, or sorry, Isaiah says, every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. And then he says this. He explains how this is going to happen, how it is that all of the wars will cease. And he comes back to talking about Jesus. For to us, in verse 6, to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And then in verse 7, he telescopes forward again, Isaiah goes forward to the wonderful consummation of Christ's victory on the cross. In verse 7, of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish it. During his ministry, he recorded in John's Gospel, Jesus seems to allude to himself, to those words, or apply those words from Isaiah 9 2 to himself. As he says, recorded here in John 8, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. The light that was prophesied in Isaiah, look at me, I am the light of the world, says Jesus. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus is the light of the world. And again, it intrigues me, is that the light that was shining in the darkness before the sun, the moon and the stars were created? Was Jesus that light then? Got to have been from the Trinity. Jesus is the light of the world, but followers of Jesus, you and I, if you put your faith and trust in Jesus here this morning, we who are part of his church are the body of Christ here to do his work until he returns to take his church with him. 
And he wants his light to shine in and through you. And I'll also say that even if you haven't yet put your faith and trust in Jesus, that same sentence I've written there applies to you too. Jesus wants his light to shine in and through you too. Now there's lots of good things that are happening through us, Christ Church, right here and right now in Durham. Recent baptisms, and I can see three of the people that were baptised fairly recently here this morning. Um, and there is more to come in the new year. There are many people hearing the gospel for the first time through the work of this church, through art or coffee shop or at Little Fishes, which is going on uh, right now. People are hearing about Jesus. In green pastures, uh, folk are coming in to buy Bibles for the first time, some of them. Ask questions about God and sometimes ask to sit and pray with people. Through the many contacts that, that Love Dearham uh, are making in the community hub, many gospel conversations are happening. And people who have never been to church before, and I have the joy of leading this on a midday on a Wednesday, many people who have never been to church before um, studying the Bible together and coming to know Christ. And I'm sure that there are many others of us here in our workplaces, uh, with our neighbours, are having one-to-one -one conversations that lead in some way towards Jesus. God is for us, and he's with us, and in many ways he's pouring out his blessing upon us. God showed um, uh, somebody in our church who shared, is here this morning, um, you'll know who you are, uh, that during the recent baptisms, he literally saw the glory of God being manifest in three lights, shining down towards the front of the church during the course of the baptisms. God's heart was and is delighted at the many good things that are happening through us as we reach out to the poor and to the marginalised, as we share the gospel uh, and lead people to faith in Jesus and what he did for us on the cross. God is with us. He is for us and he is delighted in what is happening here. But we must also be aware that the enemy knows that his time is short. God tells us in his word in many places that there is a battle going on in the heavenly realms. And the enemy is kicking back like a roaring lion, as Peter describes it, seeking whom he can devour. There is much darkness in the world, in our nation and in our local community. Wars in many places, climate change bringing devastation in many ways, floods, hurricanes, rising sea levels, wildfires, etc. I'm sure that as many, many of you will be as saddened as I am to see uh, the, the, the pushing that the enemy is doing and the whole issue over confusion, over identity. Satan is like a roaring lion. Lies of the enemy denying the truth of how God created us. And then, of course, there's sickness. That is affecting a number of us. But though darkness is all around, God says to us in Isaiah... Arise, shine. The next slide, Dan. Okay. Perhaps we won't. <laughs> uh, God says through Isaiah, Isaiah 60 verses 1, 2 and 4. Arise, shine, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. Darkness covers the earth and thick darkness is over the people's. But the Lord rises upon you and his glory appears over you. Lift up your eyes and look around you. All assemble and come to you. People are coming to know Jesus through the work of this church. Lift up your eyes and look around you. All assemble and come to you. In Eden, after 
Adam and Eve's fall into temptation, God cursed Satan in the guise of the serpent and said that an offspring of the woman would crush the head of Satan. Jesus is that offspring that God was referring to when he cursed the, sa- the, 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 uh, the enemy. Jesus descended from our first parents down through Abraham and the patriarchs, down through King David and on down to Jesus. Jesus who on the cross won the victory over all the powers of death and hell. But as I said before, in many places, Scripture shows that we should expect retaliation and we must resist every attack of the enemy. And God shows us how. In 1 Peter, verse, chapter 5, verse 6 to 9, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be alert and of sound sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. We have to be humble before our God and Saviour cast all our cares on him, alert to the the work of of darkness in our world, aware of the work of the enemy, and bringing strife and division and conflict and sickness and depression. Because in many ways, darkness is all around us, but the enemy will do all he can to disrupt us. But let's not focus on the evil one, on the one who has been defeated as Richard reminded us of earlier on the war is won instead let's focus on Jesus and what God says in that passage in 1 Peter cast all your anxiety on him when you're struggling when you're in pain when you're in sickness when you're feeling depression cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you resist the devil the work of the devil Standing firm in the face because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And as Paul says in Ephesians 6, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armour of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. And again, Richard, it's almost like you had preached my sermon in about two minutes at the beginning before we get to this. Um, Put on the full armour of God and take your stand against the devil's schemes because our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armour of God so that when the day of evil comes you may be able to stand your ground and after you've done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with a belt of truth buckled round your waist, with a breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Four times in that passage, uh, Paul says, stand, stand Stand. When you're in the midst of difficulty, when you're in the midst of depression or sickness or despair, stand. But let's stand strong in Christ and look out for one another. I remember seeing this some years ago, a list of the one another's in Scripture. Has has anybody seen that before? Do you know there are 59 one another's in the Bible? Forgive one another. Bear one another's burdens. Care for one another. Pray for one another. Encourage one another. Don't pull each other down when you see things that are happening that maybe are not quite in line with the way that you would like to see them done. Support each other. 
pray for each other. But you know the most common of those one another's is repeated in Scripture 14 times. Love one another. Stand strong together, loving one another. Many people are hearing and have responded to the gospel. People baptised in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, born again, gone from death to life, from darkness to light. But as Roy, Roy Searle shared with us last week, we read the book, we know the ending. God wins. Amen? I'm going to be a bit like Roy Searle. Wouldn't that be a shame this isn't a maybe an Afro-Caribbean church, we're all going, so, hallelujah, <laughs> preach it, brother. But the final victory has already been won. Jesus won that victory when he defeated all the powers of death and darkness. Jesus said on the cross, before he gave up his spirit, he said, it is finished. But we're living in an in-between time. And until Jesus returns, we are still in a daily battle. So let's stay strong together, encouraging each other, praying for one another, cheering each other on. There will come a day when Jesus returns, when he will take us, those who have put their faith and trust in him and what he did on the cross, to a place where there will be no more pain or suffering or sickness or death or depression or anxiety, no more wars, no more depression or doubt, no more disease or famines. And though we might often feel that darkness surrounds us, we are called to walk in the light. As David said in Psalm 27, in his song to God, he says, or he sings, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted about, above the enemies who surround me at his sacred tent, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. I came across this on, uh, on, on Monday in the morning Lectio reading. Does anybody take, I know a few people read Lectio in the morning. It's got their Lectio app. Yep, got quite a few nods there. I came across this on Monday. Um, and it... Uh, he, uh, C.S. Lewis's book, The Magician's Nephew, is quoted. And, and in one way, this is it reimagining the, uh, the, the creation account. And I quote now from C.S. Lewis, as was on the uh, Lectio app. In the darkness, something was happening at last. A voice had begun to sing. It was very far away, and Diggory found it hard to decide from what direction it was coming. Sometimes it seemed to come from all, over dire uh, all directions at once. Sometimes he almost thought it was coming out of the earth beneath them. Its lower notes were deep enough to be the voice of the earth itself. There were no words. There was hardly even a tune, but it was, beyond comparison, the most beautiful noise he had ever heard. It was so beautiful he could hardly bear it. The eastern sky changed from white to pink and from pink to gold and the voice rose and rose till all the air was shaking with it. And just as it swelled to the mightiest and most glorious sound it had yet produced, the sun arose. Yes, C.S. Lewis's words can be seen as a picture of, uh, of the dawn of creation, of how 
God shone his light upon the earth at the very beginning. But I think those words can also be read as a parable for the times we are living in right now. We are called to be lights shining in the darkness. The light of Jesus shining through us and out to others. Jesus, when he was talking to his followers, said this in Matthew 5. You are the salt of the earth. If the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. It's Jesus that before creation was the light of the world, and he will be our light at the end of time. But Jesus, during his ministry here on earth, said, I am the light of the world, and he calls us to be his light. Now he is sitting at the right hand of the Father. He wants us to be his light, to shine in and through us to those in our community. Let's not allow sickness or rivalry or division or any other work of the enemy to defeat us. We are the body of Christ and that is a deliberate metaphor. We are doing his work in his place. He's left us to do that. Let's stand strong. Let's do his work that together we can be effective to reach people for Jesus in this community. As the musicians rejoin us, I'm going to reread those opening words from John's Gospel. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Let's not let the darkness overcome the light that God wants to shine through us. Let's stay strong. Yes, we are in a battle, but we have work to do. Our penultimate song speaks of how we must stay strong in Jesus because really the battle belongs to him, but we are in him and he is in us and he calls us to do his work. Let's stand and sing. Mm -hmm.